and welcome to round six and seven of the ABB FIA Formula E World Championship here in Italy. My name's Alexa Randall and I'm joined by the one and only Saunders CB. Yes, thank you very much. Awesome to be back racing again, once again here in Italy. Now, this is the start of what I'm going to call the triple threat of European race locations. I like it, okay. Starting here, as you said, in Mazzano in Italy, a new location, but not new for Formula E racing in Italy. We've done that quite a few times and every time, I'm going to go ahead and say every time, it's delivered incredible racing. I don't think it's going to be any different this weekend. And we'll, of course, need to get stuck in as to why that's the case. Well, I mean, it makes sense. We've come off the back of an incredible run of races in this season alone. So how about we take a look at what else is coming up in the show today? Yeah, good idea. Well, we're, of course, going to be talking to the last race winner of the season, Maximilian Gunther, an unbelievable performance in Tokyo. And I sat down with him to talk all things competition, rivalry, and, of course, the element of a home race, it being the brand Maserati's home race here in Italy. We have our commentator Tom Brooks talking through every corner of this circuit. And then we're going to be bringing you the Formula E drivers themselves talking about this circuit and what we can expect to see this weekend. But before all of that, let's take a look at what happened last time out on the streets of Tokyo. All ready for the five red lights. Who is going to be big in Japan? It's lights out and we're racing here in Tokyo. Good start from Oliver Roden. Look at him, Mortara challenging. Down towards the first corner. He's going for the lead. Side by side with Roland down towards T1. He slots himself to second. It's Roland in front as they go all the way through the first corner, flicking it into the left hander. Gunther's up into third place. Then it's Jake Dennis. Then you have got Sergio Sete Camera in the ERT. They've all managed to filter through the first couple of corners relatively okay. Jake Dennis there, and is that going to mean he's going to try and put a bit of a buffer, a bit of Mortara between him? We've got a yellow flag out down at turn 15 there as well, and that is why it's a McLaren of Jake Hughes who's gone into the barrier. Let's have a look at the replay of Jake Hughes. This is what happens to him. Oh, it was contact with the apps then that sent him into the wall at 15. Mitch Evans into the wall at turn nine again. Oh, disaster for Jaguar here in Tokyo, their 100th race. I wonder if Motaro is trying to make a little gap. Um, oh, so Gunter takes over at the front from Oliver Rowland then. So Rowland now decides he wants to be the driver that follows. It's probably looking a little bit on the back foot here at this particular point because I was pretty sure he was on for the victory earlier on in this one. And now he's defending really much from De Costa, who's going for the outside into turn 15. Oh. Can he do it side by side? They go for second. De Costa gets shoveled out. Here comes Dennis coming through as well into turn 15 we've seen moves being made look at oliver Rowland on the outside there with max gunter we're side by side for third place as well just dennis holding firm as we come in towards the final sector of the lap it's advantage max gunter Rowland sitting there in second place but they're down to not 1.7 percent energy it is going to be absolutely critical to the checkered flag gunter's just got enough in his pocket as he comes through the final couple of corners maximilian gunter on the streets of tokyo takes maserati's First win since Jakarta last year. Tokyo to present the trophy to our winner, Maximilian Gunther. What a drive that was from Maximilian Gunther. I mean, the guy did everything right. He just bided his time, wait until Ollie Rowland made a mistake, and then bam, he was there and he pounced. Definition of nailing it. Yep. Um, kudos to him and the team. What a, what a phenomenal race for them. You know who else it was a phenomenal race for, though? The home race of Nissan in Japan, in Tokyo. So and Oliver Rowland gets a pole position and gets on the podium. That's a phenomenal result for them. Well, I think it really said something, the fact that Nissan always felt disappointed with second place. And considering where they were last year, how much progress they've made, that's a real testament to the team that they're suddenly now disappointed to only be on the podium. Absolutely. And if we try and contextualise that, you know, with where we are now in the season, is there a, a better a driver on a better run of form than Oliver Rowland right now? I don't, I don't I'm not sure there is. No. I think like he has shown they have what it takes to really fight for the championship this season. Who knows what that means on a circuit like this when energy management becomes a bit of a crazy thing. I'm going to get into that more later. We'll have to see if they can do it again. But three on the balance is very, very good going. Well, someone else is particularly in form at the moment and we should definitely be keeping an eye on is, of course, Maximilian Gunther. We mentioned him a minute ago. And rather than us continuing to talk about him, how about you go and talk to him? That is a fantastic idea, Alexa. <laughs> Let's see what you had to say. Maximilian Gunter, first of all, thank you for joining me. We're here in Mazzano. You can see the circuit behind us. And you're coming into this race in the best way you possibly can on the back of a race win. How are you feeling? Yeah, feeling good. Obviously, special weekend here with the home race of Maserati. And yeah, past couple of weeks have been pretty good. Feeling good in the, in the car. And yeah, certainly looking forward to 
to go out and, and race here. We're going to talk more about the home race element with Maserati later, but for now I want to kind of get your opinion on Tokyo and that kind of, because it feels like that performance was, it was bubbling, it was coming, because we saw like a big turnaround in Brazil and even before then, what do you think made that win possible for you? Yeah, I think in general we had a good start into the season and we've been working extremely hard over the over the off-season, you know, to make our package more complete, to work on the weaknesses and just to to make a, a good step forward. And I think the first few races have been good, but obviously we haven't been at the very front yet. And then we made a quite tough decision before Sao Paulo, which mm -hmm. gave us the penalty, but I think we made it for a good reason. And yeah, performance in, in Sao Paulo has been, has been very strong already. We had a very good recovery drive there. Absolutely. And yeah, then Tokyo just yeah, performed a very, I think, good weekend with good pace, good execution. And yeah, then to finally win it was obviously a big highlight and, and yeah, great feeling. So with that in mind, looking forward, but not too far forward, just to this weekend, a home race for the Maserati brand. Now that comes with all sorts of different expectation, pressure, motivation, whatever you want to call it. What does it mean for you? Obviously, it's, it's a special feeling because I race for an Italian brand and to race here in front of Italian people, it's, um, it's great. You feel all their passion and it was already special last year in, in Rome and now here again. On the approach, it doesn't change anything because it's the, the same job that I have to do here than on any other weekend. But um, yeah, I think I just want to you know, continue this, this good feeling, this good, good mindset we all have in the, in the team. And yeah, I think a lot can be possible in the next few weekends. So there's a little kind of narrative that I'm starting to build and I want to put out there. And I'm going to go, I'm going to take it back to Sao, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo, an unbelievably good grid climb up into the points from the very back of the grid. Tokyo, a race win. Mazzano, Maserati, home race. Monaco, MSG, home race. You've got all these stories pointing to you and Jahan and the team over a series of races. Does it feel like that? Well, obviously, it's a nice story that you, you're drawing there, but it's always about the performance. You want to deliver uh, on each weekend, no matter if you, if you race in a, in a home race or, or uh, just in a, in a city that is not related to your team or yourself. So, hmm. yeah, once again, I think we... We have a very clear idea of what we want to, to achieve this weekend and in the weeks to come we have good ideas of how we can further improve and, and become more competitive so that's my, that's my full, full focus right now. We've got you being one of five different drivers to win a race in five different races from five different teams. It's a, a level of competition that perhaps we haven't seen before or if we have we've seen something very similar that's really really strong. What does that mean now going forward to this weekend? Is it, are you going to be the first to replicate and get a double race win? Obviously it would be, would be great, but there are 21 other drivers who have the same, the same targets. And yeah, I think in this specific race here, it's a lot about the strategy in the race. We will see lots of overtakings, a lot of energy savings. So you really have to be smart with the way how you position yourself. And we just try to prepare in the best possible way for this weekend mm -hmm. and then we, we have to execute it well. So that's the, that's the focus. We're going into this race. You're coming off the back of a race win. It's you and the driver at the top of the standings being the only drivers that have scored points in every single race. I feel like there's momentum. I feel like there's consistency. We're all excited to see what you can do this weekend. Thank you very much. Me too. Cheers, mate. All right. Legend, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Saunders. Hello. And now we are replacing Maximilian Gunther with our very own Casey Fairman. <laughs> Both are replaceable. It's uncanny, yeah. the resemblance. Yeah, I also did win the uh, Tokyo e Prix, so you know, there we go. <laughs> what? We never knew. I know, side quest for me, but. <laughs> well, how about we talk about Misano this weekend? Because it's a big weekend for Maserati. It's the brand's home race, mm. lots of eyeballs on them, but will it be another weekend of Maximilian superiority or is he going to struggle a bit? Um, I think it's difficult to say at the moment because this is such a different circuit to what we've raced on so far this year. There's going to be so many different char characteristics. The fact that it is a permanent circuit, it's so wide, there's you know no streets that they're going to get caught out with barriers and stuff like that. So it's a very different challenge. He's also not raced here before, whereas True. his teammate Jahan has. He's got pole positions Ooh. here, podiums here in the past, so that could be a good thing for the team. But yeah, generally, I feel like we can't put all our money on Maserati because there's so much... Big ask. Yeah, there's lots that could go on. Down 
down this grid? I mean, if, if not for any other reason, purely by how competitive this season is. Like, let's look, we've had five races, five different winners from five different teams. Mm. I mean, that is very, very competitive and it kind of goes with that competitive nature that we know about Formula E. Mm. So I guess what's a good idea, in case there's any new fans watching, why don't we explain about what makes Formula E so competitive? Because it is absurdly competitive. Absolutely. I mean, one of the immediate things that jumps out for me is the fact that drivers in other championships will credit Formula E for just how competitive and intense yeah. our driver lineup is. That it's some of the best racing talent in the world. And that is something not to be sniffed at. The calibre of drivers here is phenomenal. Yeah, very much so. And it has been since season one. Like It's always been a place that big names have flocked to. And as well as drivers, we also have manufacturers, teams and stuff like here. I mean, just behind us, we have Maserati, we have Nissan, McLaren. I could go on, Porsche right behind us. Like The level of competition, big names involved in this is second to none. Yeah. It is the best of the best without, without question, because you know, what other championship has champions from all different forms of motorsport all racing in the same championship? That's very close. And this weekend is a perfect example to really see how close these guys are, how little separates the teams and drivers. Because on a circuit like this, where energy management is huge, there's very little to separate them. You know, we're talking tents here and there. And yeah, so we're going to see that this weekend. It's going to be super, super exciting. I think that's a good little definition. A few little yeah. nuggets there of why Formula E is so competitive. I love it. Not only are our drivers going to be absolutely battling out to show just how good they are around the circuit, we've got 11 rookies that will be taking to yeah. the track for our rookie free practice session on Friday afternoon, trying to show how good they are and also trying to show that maybe, maybe in the future they are worthy of a spot on this grid. It always feels weird calling them rookies because they're so much talent. So talented. But we're talking about other champions, in fact. We've got a DTM champion in that, yeah. in that rookie. We've got people that have all, all their categories, IndyCar, whatever, you know. There's a lot of talent and we call them rookies. It blows my mind. It's going to be insane yeah. seeing how they all get on and how they shape up compared to our very motley crew of drivers. So let's take a look at what Tom Brooks had to say about this incredible track. Let's have a look at the venue for round six and seven of the 2024 ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. It is the Mazzano World Circuit, Marco Simoncelli in Italy. 3.31 kilometers long is this circuit, 14 turns in total. You can see as we go down the run on the start finish straight in towards turn one, turn two, turn three and four, very tight and twisty through there. Then it begins to really open up, turn five a left-hander, then a double apex right of turn six and seven, down the long back straight into the chicane of turns eight and nine and overtaking opportunity for the drivers into there as we come in towards the decreasing radius right-handers of turns 10, 11 and 12. Turn 12 is where attack mode will be activated before two lefts of 13 and 14 to complete the lap. That's how the circuit looks, fast and flowing. I reckon we're going to see some peloton style racing here for these two rounds of the championship. It really is so great to be back in Italy and what an interesting circuit to be at. It is and mainly for the characteristics and the style of racing it's going to yes. bring this weekend. You know we just touched on it a bit about the energy management side but let's go more into that. Mm. Let's talk about Saturday's race. 38.5 kilowatt hours of energy available for 28 laps. They're just numbers. Let's turn it into information, Ooh. which essentially means that energy is going to be really tight here on okay. a circuit that is quick. You know, there's a lot of runoff areas. There's a lot of room for error, meaning that, that minimum mm. speed is higher. So they're using more energy throughout the whole race, which if you cast your mind back to the likes of Brazil this season or Portland last season or Jakarta last season, you get that style of racing is very peloton like. Nobody wants to lead and it just becomes about that moment mm. in the race when who when decides to, to launch first. Yeah. You know, who decides that we've done enough saving and now we push to the end of the race. Yeah. And he gets that right, ultimately, without any other incidents, wins the race. It's true, it's almost like calling the other's bluff of who's going to actually go for it. But I will add that in Sao Paulo, we saw Sam Burr leading a lot of that race and everybody said, if you're at the front, you're too vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And he actually still ended up winning it. So it could be that we've kind of become familiar with this peloton style of racing, nobody wants to lead. But actually, maybe with some of these software changes that we're seeing in season 10, that might not be such an issue anymore. It's all to kind of play for. And I love how nobody really knows what's going to happen. It's great. <laughs> I, th I think what's happened is basically the launch time has just come earlier. Mm. So they know enough about the cars and how, mm. how the Gen 3 can regen around certain circuits and they've just been able to do it sooner. Yeah. And Sam Bird absolutely nailed it in Brazil. He did. he did very much so. Well, we've got our opinions about what the circuit might look like this weekend, but how about we hear from what the drivers had to say? It's a bit of a new challenge. Uh, I know Mizano quite well from, from my DTM days and GT3 days, so I know the track, uh, which is always an advantage. But I think it's going to be a great race for Formula E. 
generally a track I know well from past experiences in a DTM car and uh, always been exciting to race there. I think it will be relatively high speed for our standards in Formula E, pretty high average speed, probably quite grippy as well, can be hot that time of the year, so I think there will be you know, lots of slipstreaming going on, maybe some temperature limitations like we've seen in Sao Paulo this year, so uh, definitely going to be a few challenges that await us and hopefully we can maximize those. We're going to a permanent track more like Portland, more like Valencia, where we do a lot of testing. And obviously, I think I think like the race, it's going to be a little bit more towards the Peloton kind of races that we've been seeing, a lot of slipstreaming, um, so a lot of strategy. But yeah, at the same time, going to a track that has, you know, a little bit of history in our in our motorsport world is cool. Last time I drove in Misano was uh, a long time ago in F1, so it's definitely not, uh, not going to be the same uh, the same track in uh, in Formula E, but um, I don't know it. Um, I have to remind myself of the track, which I don't wear at the moment. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting. It's nice to have a bit of a mix, you know, in between the, the silly tracks and the and normal tracks. So yeah, let's see how that goes. Yes, it's something which is quite different, like to, to, to race on a permanent track against like a um, street circuit. Uh, as a driver, especially, I would say it makes our life a bit easier in a way that. Uh, proper street circuit always are quite narrow, bumpy as well, which is on a permanent track. I would say on this side, on this aspect, made our life a bit easier. And yeah, in terms of setup as well, it's a different philosophy. Even for the driver, like to or to manage the tire, it's something we have to change a bit our mind. But it's, uh, I mean, it's part of the championship, and we adapt to it. The impression of speed that we have on a track like Tokyo is, is a lot higher than uh, than a track like Misano. So for us, I would say all the drivers, we probably prefer to, to drive in city tracks. I mean, it's for sure less scary. Uh, you do a mistake, you know, you, you go a little bit wide and uh, yeah, that's it. Here you do a mistake, you're in the wall. So it's definitely not, not the same challenge. I would say it's yeah easier to, to go to a track like Misano than here. We have quite a long back straight. Yeah, you can put the nose in everywhere you want, basically. So I think we, we will see uh, some, some good action on track. Uh, the first sector is a bit Tricky, I wouldn't say tricky, but like a lot of 90 degrees corners, so overtaking will be will be more difficult. But I think we will see a last dive and last lap action, I think. You know, we've, we've had great experiences in Rome. We're not that far away, uh, and hopefully some of the guys that enjoyed joining us there, they will come over to Misano, and we can also uh, bring some enthusiasm to new fans there. Obviously, Misano has a big history with, with MotoGP, a lot of GT racing going there as well. So let's see. Uh, if people like what they see, I think For Me has been providing amazing races, so I'm sure we're going to have a, a full house on that one as well. Just typically, the Italian people are very, uh, very passionate about motorsport in general. So I believe that we have a good atmosphere in Misano and uh, a good crowd. The amount of fans that we had last year in Rome and the years before were, were amazing, and uh, I hope they're going to be, uh, you know, as many people and uh, you know, cheering and uh, supporting us. That would be great. I think the drivers did a pretty good job of selling the weekend there and mm. now it's time for us to have our say on how they're going to do. I'm going to go to Katie Fairman first. Okay, pressure's on. I am going to go <laughs> for really predictable championship leader Pascal Verlein. That's pretty safe. I think it's a safe option. He did really well in Mexico which is also a permanent circuit so there might be some correlation there but mm -hmm. generally I feel like he's got positive momentum behind him, a car that we know is super quick and yeah I'm going to Put my money on Pascal. And a little, bit, a little bit of experience racing here That's as well true, yeah, yeah. in DTM. Ooh. I'm going to follow a similar thought because huh? the person I'm going to throw out there has the same amount of podiums as Pascal Verlein, has the same number of race wins okay. as Pascal Verlein, and is the only other driver in the grid to score points in every, other, in every race so far this season, Maximilian Gunter. He's on an unbelievable chain of form at the moment. Yeah. The momentum, I'm, I'm all aboard the Gunter train <laughs> and I'm ready to see what happens at the next stop okay, here let's in do Mizano. It. All right, so I'm going to put a lot of weight on him, no pressure, Maximilian. The other person I just want to throw out there is Oliver Rowland. Again, the form he has shown, mm. the consistency. Really impressive. Consistency, as we know, wins championships in Formula E. And Oliver Rowland is absolutely flying. So they're my two shouts. I've had a terrible run of predictions lately. But like everyone I'm predicting is doing terribly. So sorry for my prediction. Nick Cassidy, I do think you're going to do really well this weekend, but I'm very scared I'm now jinxing you. But regardless, he had a couple of tougher races recently, but he had such a strong start to the season. He's still second in the championship. I think we'll see him back on the podium this weekend, at the very least, if nothing else, because he did so well in Portland, which is not super dissimilar to here. Yeah, yeah. I also, up. think about Tokyo as well. Like, it was only because of that issue in qualifying yeah. that he didn't have an amazing race. And he still did have an amazing race from where he started. Like, yeah, yeah. Good qualifying pace, great race pace. Brings that here. Nick Cassidy is also in for a good shout. 
especially with it being a double header, there are some serious points on offer this weekend. And that is it from us as we head into the double header here on Italian soil. Make sure you're following along with all of the action. You can check us out on the Formula E website with the Where to Watch page or on the Formula E social media. Because don't forget, guys, season 10, it's on. <laughs>